Uh, my name is Ember Kelly, and I am the Director of Religious Education here at the Fourth Universalist Society in the city of New York. It's really wonderful to be here with you all tonight. So every month uh, during this last year, we've been offering in conversations events where we have guest speakers come and talk about specific topics uh, related around themes that we set for each month. This month, we've been thinking about colonialism. We've uh, had some podcasts, had some videos, and we have also been running two weeks so far, three tomorrow of our Confronting Colonialism series uh, that we have been running as an educational group, both on Google Classroom and on Zoom. And so we've been digging in deep into thinking about colonialism. And I'm really excited that tonight we get to have an awesome guest, Shane Creeping Bear, uh, join us to talk about indigenous erasure as well as the current fight against colonialism. So Shane, it's so wonderful to have you here tonight. Uh, thank you, Ember. Thank you everyone for having me. I'm excited to be here and join you for this discussion. I'm really excited also that you're having this discussion um, and was honored to be invited to um, take part in this. Uh, I, my name, uh, of course, is Shane Creeping Bear. I'm a member of the Kiowa tribe of Oklahoma. I grew up in Pittsburgh. I'm currently the Associate Director for Admission at Antioch College in Yellow Springs, Ohio. Uh, I got interested in sort of uh, liberation politics, uh, specifically about uh, uh, as it pertains to Native people in uh, North America, but uh, of course all over the world. Um, my uh, predominant focus in the area is on uh, the effects of colonialism on Native people today uh, in society and also the role that uh, higher education has played on uh, the colonial settler colonial project in the United States or as um, uh, some Native people refer to it, uh, Turtle Island. Um, <clears throat> I'm the father of five uh, amazing children, um, and I um, am also a huge um, uh, a dork, uh, love reading, collecting records, comic books, and all that good stuff, so uh, a little bit uh, about myself, so uh, yeah. So Shane, you used a term there, and I think that some folks may be familiar if they're in the Confronting Colonialism course, course Confronting Colonialism course, uh, but the term of settler colonialism, do you just want to really quickly um, make sure that we all are on the same page and understanding that term when, you, when that's used in our discussion tonight? Uh, yes, uh, when I refer to settler colonialism in general, I'm referring to the uh, settler project that uh, basically came out of Europe in order to um, spread uh, the European project around the world um, the way that we know it in um, sort of our day-to-day -day is through things like um, the the mythology of Christopher Columbus and sort of the the um, narrative of you know colonialism in the United States uh, pilgrims coming here and that sort of thing that you learn it in the classroom from a very young age um, but the way that it sort of impacts um, Native people, and, and, and in, in fact, everyone in the United States, um, in our society, uh, is pretty far-reaching. And I think the more that you explore what that term means and how it impacts um, your work and your community's work uh, and any work uh, that has to do with liberation politics, you'll see that it's uh, relative, it's very pervasive uh, aspect of our um, sort of societal identity, if that makes sense. 
I suppose so. One of the the big topics that we wanted to discuss tonight was indigenous erasure. So, for if we're doing a, a little bit of defining things, uh, would you want to maybe define what exactly that means for those who might not be familiar with the concept? Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. So, uh, erasure is a term that refers uh, to an aspect of settler colonialism in which a, an indigenous population's identity uh, is uh, erased through the process of colonialism, whether it's intentional or unintentional, it's an outcome, and, 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 and indeed it's both, uh, and it's an outcome of that project of going into uh, an, um, land and um, claiming the resources uh, removing the people, uh, their history, their ties to the land. Um, so, and I do apologize. Sometimes I have a, uh, a noisy chihuahua in the background who likes to chime in. Um, so Ch chihuahuas can have strong feelings about colonialism as well. It's true. It's true. They, they do. Um, currently today, you know, the U.S. Uh, Constitution recognizes um, um, something like uh, 573 plus federally recognized tribes. There are uh, over 230 currently seeking recognition. There are 634 um, First Nations in Canada and, of course, many many indigenous uh, groups and tribes in Me Mexico, Central America, and South America. Um, the way that the sort of the act of colonialism goes in our um, um, society is that in order to justify the genocide of these native peoples, um, they must be sort of painted as inferior. It's the colonizer's game. Uh, stereotypes and images continue that process through things like uh, pop culture, um, dominant culture, media, uh, and then it sort of continues to marginalize people and ignore and erase uh, their existence. Um, oftentimes what it'll look like is sort of a very um, homogenized, homogenized culture uh, when many people think of Native people in the United States, they think of um, uh, sort of images of teepees and, you know, riding horses or, you know, um, you know, moccasins and sort of these sort of icons. You might think of um, cartoon images that you'd see on Looney Tunes or images of Native uh, men on uh, sports mascots. Um, and, and that does sort of serve to erase the, the very diverse uh, identities of the many tribes of these lands. Um, but within the tribes, there's so many cultures and uh, you know, things like ceremonies are different. And, and, and uh, um, so it, it's, it's, it's a way to sort of minimize um, the many identities of the people who, who once existed here and who still exist here. Um, and it's an ongoing process that sort of replicates itself just through uh, media writing and of course, educational spaces. Uh, you, you start learning about um, indigenous populations in the United States as early as kindergarten when you learn about uh, Christopher Columbus discovering uh, the Americas, um, but sort of the, the very um, gentle argument against this idea of discovery is how can you discover something that was already occupied, that people already lived here and um, existed in, in, in the millions. So um, that is some ways that, that uh, I, I describe erasure. Um, I can't help but think, so I, I'm homeschooling uh, our, our kids this year uh, with the move out here. It was just the easier option. Uh, and so we, got, we get to, you know, have a little bit more control on the curriculum. And so we wanted to make sure that our kids are being exposed to the in indigenous histories. 
uh, as part of their history curriculum. But it's it's so hard to like find a video that isn't just like, oh look, uh, native peoples lived in teepees. You know what what you're saying? Like it's 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 forced down into this really really narrow definition. There's not like a broad understanding that that the you know that these were diverse groups of people, not just like a bunch of people riding horses and living in teepees. Like that the wasn't the only thing they were doing. It's it's been a real challenge to try and find good good content mm -hmm. that that is shareable um, because of this erasure. You know, it 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 dominates the way that we're able to even um, research. I know in our podcast, you and I talked about how you know maybe you go to uh, search for uh, the Pontiac tribe, but now you're going to get Pontiac cars, or you know you go to search for um, uh, a, a number of tribes and you'll get cities that have been named after those tribes. There's, there's so many ways that this erasure really can take so many different forms that just stop people from even being able to begin to engage that knowledge. Yeah. And, you know, and it happens to us too, as native people through seeing ourselves represented this way in our culture. Um, but also uh, just until I, I believe it was the 70s when we had the last uh, Indian boarding schools in the United States, um, where entire generations of um, Native children were stolen from their families, sent to these boarding schools. And at these boarding schools, something uh, interesting and te terrible, greatly terrible happened. Uh, they broke the sort of familiar familial ties. Uh, many Indigenous cultures, um, and the, the majority of them in you know, the, the, the North Americas uh, passed down oral traditions for their histories and knowledge and knowledge of how to care for the land and things like that. So you have these boarding schools that were stealing entire generations of children. Uh, they weren't allowed to speak with their families, of course. They weren't allowed to speak in their native languages. They could only speak in, in English. Um, uh, they were not allowed to wear uh, their native clothes, and of course, uh, they weren't allowed to do any of their customs and and ceremonies, and so um, that information uh, was lost. Um, you're removed from the, your ancestral land, land that you've occupied for thousands of years, um, and there's suddenly this sort of break in how that information is passed from generation to generation. And, and in fact, the way that operates today, and then when you talk about things in media and pop culture, it's like you get a, you know, a huge amount of native uh, people who have been removed, so removed from their own uh, individual cultures and ancestral uh, knowledge that they, in, in many cases, might not even know how to sort of uh, advocate for themselves in that, in that space um, because there's just uh, huge gaps in, in, in information. Uh, like I said, whole generations were, uh, were taken. So, um, so it is quite, like I said, it is quite pervasive, um, the, the amount of work that people have to do. And, and there is a huge resurgence in indigenous people um, being more uh, sort of revitalized in their communities, uh, working with their tribes. There's a huge effort in the United States right now to, um, um, to, um, bring back native languages, for example, indigenous languages, uh, many, many, many of which have been lost and, and will will never uh, be able to get back. But uh, yeah, I mean, when you look at something like native languages, um, it says one thing to an outside person, a non-native person, when you have exposure to these words um, and they end up being um, more recognizable as brands um, or street names and things but don't really understand the ties that they have and and that 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 works the same way for for native peoples too you know they see their own um, um, identities reflected this way in media and and you internalize that uh, uh, as as a people so and and again that's a, an aspect of erasure right so it's not this sort of um, um, overt thing where somebody's you know 
going into, you know, test, you know, educational centers and saying like, no, we have to teach the curriculum this way where it doesn't tell this whole story. Well, it's the story has been told like this for a long time. And so it isn't even sort of questioned. So, um, you know, you're talking about doing homeschool for your children. Well, you know, when your children go to take, you know, a standardized test, and maybe they won't, obviously, that's sort of an optional thing, but it's very much a part of uh, our educational system is the standardized testing models. Um, teaching them the actual history might actually harm them when they go to make responses to these questions, if that makes sense. So, um, so it's a huge uphill uh, path to walk to try to sort of dismantle um, where these where this information has been broken um, and repair it, obviously. Um, but there's a lot of things just in our society that just pushes that further and further away, um, either intentionally or unintentionally. Well, I think when you name language as an example, like it, I think, you know, I. Uh, prior to our conversations, like I had an idea of like indigenous erasure as like a, as a bigger concept, like how society does it. But when you start thinking about like languages, it really makes it uh, very real about like something that was taken away. Like I know that living internationally, like it was such a, a, a part of the cultural experience to get to begin to understand the language because it helped me better understand the culture. And so to have languages ripped and erased, like that, that's a, it's a real substantial thing that was taken away and, and intentionally destroyed. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you know, something um, recently, I think it was just this last October, I, I sp spoke um, at a sustainability summit on the idea of indigenous food sovereignty and um, um, sort of decolonizing sustainability practices. And one of the things that you might not think about is, you know, what you'll hear in these sustainability conversations and conservation um, is, you know, we've got to find new ways to, to care for the land and new ways to like, um, you know, replenish, uh, an, you know, animal populations. And um, these are th things that native people were doing for thousands of years, you know, it's not like they didn't exist. So there's this idea that this is not new information. It was just taken away from not only native people, but everyone could have benefited from understanding how to uh, maintain buffalo populations and in the, you know, in the Great Plains and, and how, how that in and of itself impacts a wider net of um, um, ecological cycles. Um, Indigenous people cared for the land in, in a way that was reciprocal. Um, and, and that information is gone in a lot of ways and, and we won't be able to reclaim it. And many of it, again, huge efforts to revitalize a lot of that information and a lot of uh, you know, tribes uh, and people have, have maintained some of that knowledge and, and, and in fact are putting a lot of work into rebuilding things like um, food uh, trade pipelines across the Americas and into the um, Central and South Americas. Um, but that type of erasure sort of um, has had a larger um, impact on, on, you know, how, how our food systems operate. And, and it's, it's all, all sort of coming to light that it's not sustainable, um, but it's not new either. You know, this is just, um, things that the, the settler colonial project has sort of taken away from us. So that seems like a, a good lead into my next kind of question, which, you know, as we think about this, this being part, like the indigenous erasure is part of this overall project. So how, like, how, how, how does this connect? How is this made part of this wider effort to colonize and specifically to colonize and settle the, the land? Like uh, what, what role does indigenous erasure play in that? And like what, if you, if you wanna name other parts of, of that broader uh, effort of settler colonialism, feel, feel free to as well. Hmm, uh, this, is, this can get complicated quick. Um, um, so erasure sort of clears the path, you know, it, it sort of clears the consciousness, the mind, you know, if there's no people, there were no people here, 
um, this was land that was here for us to take. We, we, we as colonizers came in and, and just reaped the benefits of what was already existing here. Um, and, you know, it, there were, you know, maybe there were some people here, but not, not a lot. I mean, sort of, sort of like this way of sort of skirting the responsibility of the, the decisions. And, and, and then in turn, that's sort of the foundational pillars of our society uh, in, in the United States um, that colonization happened and it was good and it was good for for us in the US and we sort of enjoy the the benefits and privileges of having uh, that colonized land right um, and so and then and in that way when they maintain um, that sort of narrative that that mythology that people can rally and get behind you're, you're not going to get a lot of people pushing back against that um, um, and, and in fact I mean you don't um, this is a conversation that's just sort of happening about pushing back the uh, false narratives and pushing it back against that that mythology uh, of our you know the foundations of, of our society in the United States um, the you know the interesting uh, well yeah so I mean that's it's sort of uh, a, a, you know, a, a broader breakdown, but, um, um, well, I suppose we can, uh, I can help narrow it down here a little bit because, um, I don't know if you saw it, but Rick Santorum, who, gosh, I don't think he's been in the news since like 2008. Uh, it was a name I had not seen in a while. Um, and, uh, he was in the news. Uh, I, I saw it a few days ago because he said something along the lines of that Native Americans didn't contribute much to, to American culture. Uh, and, you know, as, as I, it was, you know, shared uh, on many of the news sources with, with a sense of outrage, but then, I, you know, as, as I read it and as I've been learning about colonialism at the same time, I'm like, is, is he lying? <laughs> like, you know, was, there was this intentional erasure right. that, that was done. Um, right. So, you know, it, it seems that, Erasing is, you know, part of this effort to uh, take the land yeah. in a sense as well. It is. To... Yeah. So, you know, when you think about the, you know, sort of the foundational um, aspects of, of how the, the United States was formed, um, it was really, you know, is built on uh, the backs of African slaves, um, stolen labor and stolen land, the land that the indigenous people of Turtle Island occupied. Um, uh, yeah, so I mean, it made sense to to make as many native people either non-existent, so the land was theirs for the taking, or um, or to even categorize them as, in some cases, white um, through assimilation practices like uh, boarding schools and things like that, um, because you know, and, and this is sort of sort of a heady concept, but because indigenous people were valued for their land, um, it made sense to sort of bring them into the fold or assimilate as much as you could. And of course, whatever uh, you couldn't assimilate um, from their identities, uh, you could just simply take. Um, and, 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 and that, you know, happened, of course, through things like land speculation, um, um, people like George Washington uh, were huge land speculators. They made their money by uh, removing native people from land. His, his, his huge project was the Ohio Valley here. Um, and of course, you don't hear that part of his history, um, um, uh, where, where his wealth came from was eradicating native populations. Um, and again, so when you're thinking about this sort of this, this rooted mythology, um, um, and how it, how it plays out in, in the classroom, for example, when you start learning about these people early on. Um, but yeah, I mean, so yeah, I mean, the, 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 that's easier to steal land when people are not here. And in fact, a, a good example that I like to use is just the national park system. Um, it's sort of dark. Um, ba basically, you know, I, I always push back against this idea of wilderness. Uh, wilderness is something that's 
um, human made. Um, it's, it's, it's not wildness. So like wilderness, for example, um, there was an article and I, and I might've even referenced this, um, in the podcast discussion, but there's an, a, a, an article from a Times, Time magazine um, titled The Story We've Been Told About America's National Park System. And the pool quote that I use is the national park system has long been lauded as America's greatest idea. And, and again, this is like, you know, this is, it seems like a good idea. Like we've got us, we've got to preserve this land, this gorgeous land so that companies can't go in and, 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 and destroy it and, and, and take all of this resource. Right. So, so it is, it seems like a good idea. Right. But uh, only relatively recently has it begun, begun to be more deeply questioned in his 1999 book, Dispossessing the Wilderness, Indian Removal and the Making of the National Parks, uh, Mark David Spence delivered a long overdue critique that linked the creation of the first national parks with the federal policy of Indian removal. Spence points out that the first so-called wilderness areas that had deemed in need of preserving were not only and in actuality indigenous occupied landscapes, when the first national parks were established, but also that an uninhabited wilderness had to first be created in order to make the national parks, right? So there's this dark history with the national park system um, where they literally were removing people from the land in order to protect it, right? Um, so, so yes. Uh, I suppose that's, you know, naming one way that colonialism is, is quite dangerous. Uh, and you mentioned that, you know, a lot of this, for a lot of places, this discussion is just starting to happen. So like, why is, is it crucial uh, for people and for communities to really get exposed to thinking about colonialism? Like, why, why is this an important step in like fighting for justice? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just sort of, uh, if you can't s articulate it, and there's no way to, to, to name it. And I, and I think, um, this, the mythology, the, the information um, is so deeply ingrained and entrenched. It's, it's really hard to sort of see a, a way out of that. It's, it's, it's gotten, it's had a lot of time. It's had centuries to sort of like really sink in uh, to our society, to our, to our, to our thinking. Um, um, that it, it's, it's, a it's sort of an, almost seems like an insurmountable goal, um, but certainly a, a libertary, uh, 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 goal. Um, I, I, I think that pushing back against the narratives, even if they're small pushbacks, um, it is important to sort of be able to name these things. And I, and I think this is important, you know, across the board um, um, for, for a lot of things, not just uh, colonialism and uh, indigenous histories, indigenous sovereignty. Um, but to be, to be able to name something, to be able to have groups discussing it, um, um, to be able to put this on a larger platform eventually, you know, in my, in my mind, I see sort of this general sort of awakening of these ideas um, as people start to talk about them more and more as information isn't as sort of guarded by, um, you know, institutions, uh, you know, of, you know, academic institutions, um, um, as people can have conversations in, in social media um, information is passed. I think that uh, the conversation becomes more prevalent um, and it's uh, going to be a net benefit for our, our society as a whole and not just the um, liberation of indigenous people in the United States. Um, I, I, I just think it's a, a, a good, good, it's good work to engage in. And, and, and it's just good to know the, the, the truth. Right. It's just good to understand, have these understandings of these things. For me, uh, you know, growing up in Ohio, 
uh, going to public school, when I started hearing this stuff, it was just, it was, it almost knocked me off my feet. And of course, um, you know, I, I have that extra layer of, of being Native American um, and having, you know, family and, and relatives and friends um, who are Native American. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's absolutely crucial to expose this, this truth uh, to our society. And it's absolutely, um, I think, crucial to, for example, just for example, um, the planet when you're thinking about sustainability efforts um, and like revitalizing uh, what that could look like to help uh, build a better relationship with our planet and with our earth. Um, the, you know, that kind of stuff. So there's sort of a, a general social benefit, a societal benefit of, of a liberation of an oppressed um, people. Uh, but then there's this added uh, other um, area of just general, it, it would be good for the world um, to sort of release ourselves of the, this colonial way of thinking about um, taking resources and gathering them and and giving them to a few people at, at the top, you know. Definitely. Uh, so I think we, we've talked a bit about the history. I'd love to also make sure that we're, we're highlighting some of the present day struggles that to, you know, that this is, there's still ongoing pushback against colonialism. So what are some present day struggles that you'd like to, you know, really spotlight and, and highlight as things that people should know about? Yeah, absolutely. And I can give you, you know, links to share information. Um, um, there's, there's a lot, but the things that I would sort of point people towards looking to um, are the, the no DAPL. And that's the movement that popped up around the um, um, access pipeline uh, in North Dakota. Um, the movement to stop the pipeline uh, and protect the waters. Um, uh, I, I can drop links. Maybe I can drop links in chat. So um, I always like to bring up the movement uh, for missing and murdered indigenous uh, women. Um, there's sort of a, a phenomenon that indigenous women are stolen and find up end up um, murdered at, a, at an extremely high rate especially in uh, native populations around reservations in towns around uh, oil communities in Canada and there's a website that has a report on this um, sort of movement and um, how you can sort of help support and become involved um, and then another movement that I always uh, recommend is the Native American food sovereignty movement. And there's a lot of information, there's a lot of people doing it, but just to get started doing some research, uh, I, I will point you towards the uh, Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance page. Um, so you can find out more information about what food sovereign sovereignty is um, and how you might be involved in that type of uh, liberation, um, politically speaking. Um, but other than that, I mean, I, I guess I, I, at that, at that point, I, I would ask folks to do a little bit of their own research, um, into these things. I know we talked in the podcast a little bit about it, uh, you know, land acknowledgements, um, especially in like churches have, have become, uh, pretty, I don't, I don't want to say common because I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say they're common, but they've become something that, that people do uh, occasionally do as, as parts of services, especially like on Indigenous Peoples Day in, in November. Uh, so what are, what are some ways that like a congregation the, as a community um, that we could be involved in like deco first, you know, decolonizing ourselves, but also then getting involved in the anti-colonial work? Um, you know, some more as maybe as a community, and then we can maybe talk about it on, a, on an individual level as well. Well, certainly doing a little bit of research on your own is is helpful just to sort of understand. There's a lot, you know, and, I, and I'll be I'll be real honest for folks who are just sort of engaging or hearing about this stuff for the first time, it can feel a bit overwhelming where to put your energy and learning about 
this stuff. I think I always bring up the land acknowledgement as sort of a very practical uh, first time um, um, practice that you can bring into an organization to work towards a, a larger decolonial effort. Um, I'll explain a little bit about a land acknowledgement. Um, have you have you done anything like that with your congregation? We did uh, in the confronting colonialism class uh, during our introductions. We identified um, and the Google Classroom. We identified the land uh, that we were residing on uh, mm -hmm. from where we were we were coming from. Yeah, absolutely. and I know it has been done in a few services. It's not a regular part of services yet, but I know uh, we we were having. We're, we're, we had found some uh, a local uh, Lenape organization in New York and where um, a few of the staff were trying to reach out and build some connections there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I'll just explain, I'll describe a land acknowledgement from sort of my point of view um, briefly. Uh, and then, uh, and I will put a tiny asterisk here uh, that for native activists and um, people involved in these conversations, it can be a bit of, um, um, uh, a mixed response to how uh, people feel about land acknowledgements. And, and not surprisingly, organizations um, can tend to use land acknowledgements as sort of a band-aid or um, a superficial fix, uh, that type of thing. But so, so the, the idea is to not, to not use the land acknowledgements in a superficial way. It is definitely something that will help you as you work towards a de more decolonial um, or organization or practice or congregation. So, um, but I, I mean, I do think they are uh, important for a few reasons. They do engage people in the sort of understanding and history of the land that you reside on. It can, um, and it's most basic, should seek to honor the original inhabitants and stewards of the land in a more complex way, but it, um, it can open up a broader conversation of what it means to heal those histories that we're sort of talking about in this conversation, uh, about pushing back about that new narrative, growing and developing that conversation more, acknowledging the land is definitely a first step towards doing that sort of healing work. Uh, but, in, you know, building that holistic relationship with, with the land, um, we can begin to establish and sustain relationships with like the Lenape organization, you know, people, students, organizations outside of your congregation. Uh, you can have a broader, initiate broader conversations about equity and justice by acknowledging those sort of injustices and false narratives about our history. Um, uh, a land acknowledgement is also a formal statement that recognizes the unique and enduring relationship that exists between indigenous, indigenous people and their traditional territories. It offers you know, honor and respect and demonstrates a dedication uh, from your own organization of growth and development. They can inspire action. They can create broader public, public awarenesses. Um, the land acknowledgements can also remind us that colonization is in fact an ongoing process. It's not something that was abstract or happened in the past or was just this one instance, you know, when we talk about colonization is something that's ongoing and happening, you know, as we speak, it's not a, a fixed point in time. Uh, many indigenous cultures uh, in, in, in the United States open up their spaces and ceremonies uh, with honor and respect for the earth. And this is sort of a way to take a cue from that aspect of our own ceremonies and practices um, and protocols as we, as we intentionally work towards the uh, healing uh, relationship uh, and society's relationship with the land. So before we turn to some open question and answer time, is there any just kind of final thoughts that you'd like to share before we turn to open question and answer? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think I, 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 I acknowledge that, that a lot of this is 
there's a lot of information and it, and it goes in a lot of different directions. I, I think that having these conversations is important. I'm excited to hear some of the questions that uh, the group comes up with. I think these can be challenging conversations because they, they do challenge us in a way that, um, like I said, even me as, as a native person uh, was hearing this, this, this information. I, I was confronted with a lot of this information for the first time, you know, just in the last decade or so. And it, it was jarring. It was jarring to, you know, um, my childhood who, who like what I saw is like this, this huge part of like my learning and growth as, as a person in school and, and things like that. So uh, I encourage you to be to patient and take your time. Um, you know, one of the things I always say is that, you know, I'm here to educate. Um, I'm here to enlighten, you know, I'm not here accusing, I'm not here to forgive or like anything like that. It's just, it's just strictly to have the conversation, put it on the table. And from there, you all can decide what you do with that information, of course. Um, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm uh, always excited to have this conversation. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and turn off our digital recording. So if anybody is watching this in the future on YouTube, it was wonderful to have you digitally join us on YouTube in the future. Uh, and we'll turn to our question and answer set time. <laughs>